Hello everyone, this is Mike Fauche, and in today's video, I'm really excited to review the brand new Ugreen DXP 4800 Plus. This is a brand new 4-bay NAS unit from Ugreen that's aimed at bringing you more power and features at a much lower price point. There's been multiple videos on this new device, some of which have brought out some of the early issues. So in this video, I want to go over the current status of the device, test the basic functionality such as file sharing, users, and permissions, as well as go over some performance in comparison to competitive NAS units to see how it does. If you want to find out how this stacks up and whether or not you should consider buying this NAS, then watch the rest of this video. And if you haven't already done so, please don't forget to like and subscribe if you find this useful, as it really does help support the channel. Full disclosure before we get into this device is that Ugreen did send me the device and the four hard drives used in this review, but they haven't paid or influenced this video in any way. And as always, the results and opinions are my own, and they'll be seeing this for the first time just as you are. Before we load up some drives and set this up, let's start out by going over the specs and taking a close look at the hardware. One of the main reasons I wanted to test this device is that on paper, this device is feature packed at an extremely competitive price point. It sports the Intel Pentium 8505 15 watt 5 core 6 thread mobile processor that has 4 efficiency cores and 1 performance core. It comes standard with 8 gigs of DDR5, but it's expandable all the way to 64 gigs, and we'll talk about this later on in the video. Looking at the back of the unit, we have a power input from the external power supply, a reset button, a 10 gig Ethernet port, a 2.5 gig Ethernet port, two USB 2.0 ports, a 5 gig USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type A, and an HDMI port. The fan configuration on this device is a little unique in that it actually draws air from outside through this removable filter and pushes it through the front of the unit, which in theory keeps your device cleaner as cool air is filtered before pushing it through the device. Most NAS units will exhaust from the back fan, which usually brings dust into the system. Looking at the front of the unit, we have four 3.5 inch bays, a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type A and C port, both of which are capable of 10 gigabits per second. And next to that, we have an SD card reader and the LAN and drive status lights. The drive trays on this are extremely nice and better built than many more mature NAS units. Pressing the bottom tab releases the handle so you can pull the drive tray out and load the drive. There's a release button on the tray itself that allows the tray to expand and easily load the drive and securely hold it in place. Let's go ahead and see what else comes in the box. You get a 150 watt external power supply, which is more than enough to power this device and all the drives in it. A power cord, drive tray keys so you can lock the drive trays, a small instruction book, a screwdriver and screws in the event that you want to use a two and a half inch SATA drive and a couple of Ethernet cables and two extremely thick thermal pads for the NVMe drives, which we'll cover later in the video. Let's go ahead and load all four drives and get this thing configured. As I mentioned earlier, you just press on the release tab, put the drive in and press the side of the tray to lock it back into place. Now that we've loaded up all the drives, we can go ahead and set this up. Like most mainstream NAS devices, such as QNAP or Synology or TerraMaster, there are two main ways that you can set up and configure the NAS. The first is to use the client application, which you can download from their site. Just install it on your computer, and then you can launch it and set it up from there. The second way is to look up the IP address from your router's DHCP list and just type in the IP address directly into your browser, which is typically what I prefer to do. I'm not a big fan of downloading different utilities, so I prefer to just look up the IP address. After you type in the IP address into your browser, it'll take you into a configuration and allow me to name the device and create an admin account and password, as well as optionally set up a mobile number to receive 2FA verification codes. But for this video, I'm going to skip that part. On the next screen, you can set the options for updates. The default is to automatically install only important updates but I always prefer to install all updates, which I do on almost everything I have, but it's up to you what you want to set. As this is a new release, I imagine there'll be many more updates over the upcoming weeks, so I think it's important that you keep this thing current. 
Once I make a selection, I'm taken to the desktop. Some of the more mature operating systems will have a wizard that will walk you through the entire process, such as setting up your first storage pool, shared drives, users. But as this is a new OS, you'll have to walk through your basic setup on your own. In this particular case, because of the update settings, it started to download and install the most recent update. Once I started, I was back on the desktop with a notification reminding me that I needed to have at least one storage pool and provided me with a link to the Create Wizard. Clicking on the link to create launches the Create Wizard. The title of the screen is a little misleading as it implies hard disk replacement, but in reality, this is your creation wizard. Clicking on Start, you have to make a couple of choices. The first is the RAID type. Because there are four drives in this system, it recommends a RAID 5, which is what I would use, but you do have the option to change it if you want to. Next, you're going to select the drives you want to include in the storage array and click on Next, where you'll get a warning that your drives are not on the compatibility list. Ugreen hasn't completed their compatibility list, but all NAS drives should work fine. Next to capacity, most of the time you'll just leave that at default, which is the total capacity, and then hit Next where you'll get a warning that you'll be deleting all the data on your hard drives. You'll have to type in your password to actually complete this operation. The next couple tabs on this screen are for internal and external drive management and health status, so we'll skip this for now. In the next section is where we want to create our first shared folder. Opening up the file manager lets you click on the plus sign and select create shared folder. Let's give it a name and select the volume location. Most of the time, there'll only be one volume unless you created multiple volumes or if you created a separate volume using the M.2 NVMe drives as a separate volume, which we'll talk more about later in the video. We'll skip the next two boxes and select Create. The next screen will allow you to sign permissions to the folder that you created to different users and click OK when you're done. You can create folders first or users first, it doesn't really matter. Let's create a couple of users and verify that permissions are enforced on the folders. In the control panel, select User Management and click Add and then Create. Give it a username and a password, and you can optionally add an email address and description. We won't go into user groups in this video, and it's not required to create a user. Click Next and set the folder permissions to each folder that you want to have this user access. For this limited user that we created, I'll select Read Only just to make sure that the NAS handles limited permissions. I'll create one more user and we'll give that read and write access so that we can test that as well. One last thing in order to see and access your folders from your system is that you will have to enable SMB. Currently, as of this video, SMB was off by default, so you'll have to go and enable it yourself. To do that, go into the control panel, go to file services, and then enable it under the SMB tab. You can leave the rest as defaults for now. Let's verify that the permissions are working as intended. I'll log in using the first system with the limited account we created. And as you can see, I can read the contents of the folder, but if I try to create a folder or delete a file, it won't let me. Logging in from a different system using the unlimited user, I can see the same contents. However, now I can have the ability to create a folder as well as to delete files. Before we get into some of the testing and benchmarking, let's take a quick look at some of the features that are currently in the control panel. We've already seen the user management section, so let's move over to file services. This is where you can enable SMB, FTP, NFS, and other settings. Following good security practices, everything is off by default, and you'll have to enable what you want to use. Device connection is where you can set up an internal domain name, enable remote services, and set up your portal settings. As I mentioned in every NAS review I've done, I would suggest not using these and use something like Tailscale or OpenVPN for versatility and security. Next, we have hardware and power. Here you can set your buzzer, fan, LED settings, and in the power tab, you can define shutdown schedules, energy savings, and power restore states. The next tab is for UPS settings, should you have one attached, and I would certainly recommend you do. Next is time and language, and below that is network settings. Under network connection is where you can set or change your IP address and other network related settings for either of the LAN ports. The last tab I want to talk about is the security tab, which is similar to other NAS units and lets you set logout time as well as lockout settings for failed attempts. 
As this may not be the final version of the software, I'll do a full security settings video in the future once this begins shipping and the OS is a little more mature. Now that we've seen the hardware and the software, let's test the performance. Remember that this is a RAID array made of 5400 RPM drives, so the expectation of performance is mainly influenced by the speed of drives, and as you'll see, the amount of RAM that you have. To start with, let's copy about 45 gigs to the array. I replicated these tests with additional RAM on the DXP4800 Plus, as well as copy the same data to my QNAP, which has slightly faster drives. And as you can see from these benchmarks, the DXP4800 Plus performs extremely well and is only slightly slower than my QNAP, which has faster drives. When I increase the RAM on the DXP4800 Plus, the performance really smoothed out and as you can see from these test results was considerably faster. Next I wanted to test the system without the limitations of slower mechanical hard drives, so I added two 1 terabyte NVMe SSDs. It's really easy to add an SSD to this device. Just power it off, turn it over, remove the two screws at the bottom, install your NVMe drives and apply the thick thermal pads to the bottom of the SSD and put it back on. This also is the place where you can add or replace RAM should you want to add more. There are a couple different ways that you can create a new pool using your SSD drives. You can go to the storage manager under the storage management section and click on create. Select storage pool. You can also do it from the hard disk management section tab by clicking on the triple dots next to your newly installed SSDs and just select use. On the next prompt, select create storage pool and pick the RAID type. Because this thing only has two drives, I'll stick with the RAID 1 configuration which will provide me some redundancy. Next, select the two new M.2 drives and hit next. You'll again get the compatibility warning as well as the format warning. Type your password and let it complete the new storage pool. To test the SSD performance, I created a shared folder on the SSD pool and ran the same test. I tested it using both the default RAM configuration as well as the configuration with additional RAM. Much like we saw with the spinning drives, the extra RAM has a huge impact on performance, but with the SSDs the impact is much more significant. The performance here is on par with any other high-speed NAS that's currently on my network with default MTU values and no optimization. Having seen the early videos of this device, it's pretty obvious that Ugreen has done a lot of work on this OS. Just prior to releasing this video, they added Docker support, so you can now run Docker containers. And during my use of the DXP4800 Plus over the past several weeks, I didn't have any major issues with this device. The software is in the early phases and the apps are being added, but I'm confident it will grow to feature parity of the competition in the really near future. That said, most of us buy a NAS for storing data, and that part works extremely well. As you saw from the benchmarks, the performance with and without additional RAM is extremely good and rivals more seasoned products. It's evident if you want to extract the most from this device and be ready for containers and other applications such as Plex that you'll want to add additional RAM to take full advantage of it. But overall, I was really impressed with this device. As of this video, there was still a huge discount on this device. It could be bought for a really attractive price which is really tough to beat as you get quality hardware and great performance. I really want to thank the team at Ugreen for sending me the NAS and the hard drives so that I could test this device. And as it turns out, it's far better than I thought. If you can pick up this thing at a discount price, it'll be tough to beat for this level of hardware. That's about it for today's video. And please don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button if you find this useful. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.